I declare that we will be sensitive to that assignment and that calling that you have upon our lives, and we will make it a priority, Lord, to exceed, to receive not the applause of man, but the applause of heaven, of you, Lord, that you have called us out, Heavenly Father, and you have given us the gifts and power to go into this world and be ministers, to be disciples, Heavenly Father, and that you go with us, Heavenly Father, so that we never have to go on this alone, Lord. We thank you as you just continue to guide us, Heavenly Father. And as we end this year and we go into a brand new year, that I just continue to speak Amos 9.13, that your word says that it won't be long now, that things will happen so fast that our heads will swim. One thing on the heels of another, we won't be able to keep up. And everywhere we look, blessings, blessings, and favor that just continue to overtake us, Heavenly Father, so that our children's children are blessed, our friends and our family are blessed, Heavenly Father. And I declare over each one of us that our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, and our mind cannot comprehend the amazing and wonderful blessings, Lord, that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's a wrap. That was great. I know. Yeah. And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. So I'm Michael McSorley, my wonderful wife, Jennifer McSorley. We are doing the book, Boundaries in Marriage by uh, Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. We are on chapter 12, right? Yeah. Yep, chapter 12, Protecting Your Marriage from Intruders. Yeah, and previous, so the past previous, three previous lessons were our values for setting our boundaries, which was amazing and powerful. And just when we thought it couldn't get any better, this chapter comes in. And we're looking at it and we're like, how true is it? You know, when it's three, a crowd. And we have to be really, really protective and very careful as to what that three is. And one of the things that I like to do is when I read this, is I literally called this chapter, When the Outside Affects the Inside. When pressure and temptation comes upon us, right, that wants to take away the time that we have with our spouse because we're not strong enough to say no. And even more powerful than that, our relationship with God. And they said in the book that one of the greatest enemies of marriage is called triangulation. And that's when you have your husband and you have the wife, but then you have something else external. Either it's something or it's someone that comes into it. And in my mind, when I'm sitting there thinking about it, I'm like, this isn't necessarily an enemy. In my mind, when I see triangulation, it is God, Mike, and myself. We are that triangle. God is that third thing, and it's not an intruder that comes into our relationship. But how many times do we let things and let people step into the bond that we have and the relationship that we have? Well, and, and to be very clear, the book is not talking about the triangulation with God. Right. Okay. So what, what the book is talking about is the triangulation of you— and somebody else and your spouse or your spouse and somebody else and you there's no god up there at that point it is strictly a an emotional a physical or something going on that that third party intruder is meeting the needs of your counterpart and I think one of the things, so we stumbled and we fell in our marriage up until maybe five or six years ago, thank goodness for restoration, is that I couldn't talk to Mike. We were messed up. When we were, I think from the very beginning, we never had a good foundation of communication. You know, I saw how my parents communicated or didn't, and, and he did the same, and we brought that lack of communication into our marriage. And he was very much the very vocal one, and I was very much kind of the worldly kind of like, submissive one where I didn't want to kind of ruffle feathers. I didn't like arguing because I heard my parents arguing and that hurt me. I heard my dad arguing and my mom not really sticking up for herself. And he also had a very similar background. And so I just basically decided that if I didn't say anything, then everything would get resolved. So we would have these like arguments and stuff. And then like he would get really upset. He'd run away and we go to sleep angry, we go to sleep separate, or he would literally leave the house, or I would leave the house as well. And then the next morning, he was kind of over it. And it was still heavy on my heart, and I wanted to talk about it, but then he was all, I'm over it, everything's fine and wonderful. No, so, hang on, I, I've never once said, 
I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm over it. My perception of you, you was, okay, I was horrible. I said horrible things to her. We're fine. Let's move on. Let's go to dinner. Here are some flowers. Here's something for you. And I thought, okay, he's really sorry. He didn't say he was sorry. And I never mentioned what had happened that I before. Yeah, and it just dusted it under the rug. But in my mind, hey, you know what? Everything's fine. So I, I, well, there was no reason to bring it up because she seemed okay with it at this point. So why would I want to bring up something that would make her upset again? And I thought it was kind of like I just brushed it under the rug. It was totally fine. It was totally fine. Totally fine. But the next time we had an argument, what do you think we were also fighting about? What's under the rug? What's under the rug? <laughs> Everything. And that rug began to just build and build and build until it just kind of imploded. And everything just came out all at once. And I think one of the things that I would do is I couldn't get him to communicate with me. Because I was always worried that every time I would come to him in a loving manner, because I, I wasn't very confrontational with him. I was somewhat passive. I was like, okay, you know, Monica, you know, I, I really got my feelings hurt. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you, first of all, I'm saying to you, and his guard immediately goes up. He would convince me that I did something to make him act like that. So then I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, well, maybe if I hadn't done that, I mean, how crazy is that? I literally thought that I was the reason we had the argument. That wasn't the reason we had the argument, right? I played a part in it, and he played a part in it. But I couldn't go and talk to him anymore. So part of the triangulation in there, the third part became my mom that I was venting to. It became another man who was sticking up for me when he wasn't sticking up for me, who wasn't listening to me who wasn't telling me that I was valuable, who wasn't meeting the need that I had, and meet, also meeting my love language. I didn't even know about love languages back then. I'm words of affirmation. And he wasn't giving me words of affirmation. He was beating me down and making me feel horrible about myself. So the second somebody listened to me, the second that somebody actually showed an interest in me, I gravitated towards that. And that's where, as unhealthy as it is, that's where I found my value. That's where I found my voice. And so, you know, a lot of, I don't know if it's a female thing or not, I, or just a family thing from my standpoint, I've never talked to my family, ever, about any issues we've had. I don't know if it's a guy thing or if it's a family more thing. You're more, you're more I am, you're but, more but, but I don't know if, it, it, like I said, I don't know if it's a guy thing or a family thing from our family, because we, we've never, we've never been close, our family, ever. So, you know, I'll go five, six months without talking to my mom. So, I, I mean, just kind of, hey, got nothing to say, so why call, right? That's just kind of how we've been. So, the problem, the other side of that is her and her mom were so close, all she did was talk to her mom. Do you think her mom heard any positives? No. Nothing about, hey, Mike did this. Mike was great at this. Mike this. It was always, Mike did this. I can't believe he's doing this. And it poisoned her parents against me. Now, granted, I was not the, the most amazing husband in the world. We were in the world. We were but very the, much but, the but the fact is that my family had no clue as to what was going on. Because I always talked about how great Jennifer was and never sat there and talked about any of the negative things that had happened. So it was a big aha whenever we found out that, oh my gosh, that's why her mom has all this animosity because she never saw any good things. And it's not, I forget who said it, but don't say anything to your family that you would not want brought up at Thanksgiving. Period. If you're going to say something to your family that you wouldn't want them to say out loud at Thanksgiving, don't say it. I'm not saying internal. I'm saying find somebody that is a godly person that can understand what you're saying and then tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Your parents are going to tell you what you want to hear because they're defending you. Period. All they hear is the bad stuff. They don't hear the other side of how bad you were 
in that whole situation. There's always three truths. Yours, theirs, and the truth. Always three sides to the story. We've talked to people in, in the past where he sat there. I remember the, the husband sat there and he said, uh, you know, but I've got to tell my mom all this stuff. because Mom and I are so close. And and the wife had said, yeah, but your mom is telling you how horrible this is and, and, and how you shouldn't be with me. Why in the world would you talk to your mom about it? Like, well, I don't want to, but she holds it against me if I don't. She makes me feel guilty if I don't. I don't do you remember that one where we down? Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? That makes no sense at all. I mean, he was he was held captive, by, literally held captive by his mother. Pattern, family pattern. It, it, something came up somewhere. And that was the sad part of, and, and I said to him, I said, it's not going to be easy, but you got to make a choice. Do you love your wife or your mom? And it's not, do you not love your mom? But it's, who are you going to pick right now? You can't pick both. Either you choose to move forward with your wife and say, Mom, I love you to death. You are the best thing that's ever happened to me. Unfortunately, if you are going to speak disrespectful and unloving to my wife and about my wife, then, then, then we don't have anything to talk about. Is that easy to do? Absolutely not. Her and her mom are extremely close. My mom, I'd have no problem saying that to because we're not that close. I mean, we're close, but we don't, I mean, it's not that, that want to talk every day type thing. I mean, heck, on Connor's birthday, just the other day, I hadn't talked to my mom in like four months. I said, hey, how you doing? I'm like, fine. She was, hey, Miss talking to you. I said, yeah, me too. She was, nothing's really going on. I said, yep, need nothing much here. Nothing else yet. Nothing's changed. Said, yep, okay, good enough. Okay, love you. Love you too. I mean, literally, that was the conversation. And it's not that I don't love my mom. It's just that I'm not the kind of person that if, unless something has happened, I'm not going to pick up the phone and call you and go, hey, what's going on today? Now, my old roommate, every single day, had to talk to his mom. They have that kind of relationship. And so you've got to make sure that your relationship is not with your father, your mother, that it's with your spouse and God. And even more importantly than that, that it's not with your spouse and somebody else that is feeding them what they want to hear. Because that's what they do. They feed them, whether it's their friends that are ungodly, that are living in the world because they're on their side. Or whether it is somebody that is looking to find a way in. That is doing all they can do to make sure that your spouse believes that they are the ones that care about them and not you. And we continue, like we were in this position, and we continue to also minister to couples as well. Whereas, you know, when there is infidelity or there it, it gets close to infidelity, and thankfully that it stops, that either one of the spouses is kind of of the mindset where, well, you know what? Well, they went ahead and cheated on me. Well, that's their fault why it happened. That's their fault why it happened. No. You need to look in the mirror and realize at the end of the day, what we hear over and over again is this person was fighting for me. This person was sticking up for me to him. His responsibility is to have my back in everything. My responsibility as his wife is to have his back in everything. There shouldn't be another woman coming into our relationship having his back and sticking up for him. That's my job and vice versa. And one of the things, too, you can also make a child part of that third. And that's exactly what happened in the relationship with the story that Mike had shared is that this lady, the mother, was having issues with the dad, and she didn't have that type of connection. Granted, she didn't seek anything outside of the relationship. 
but she ended up making her son the priority of somebody that she came to and she dumped on. I was in a very similar situation. My dad and my mom, they are now divorced. Free will, whatever have you. 50 years. 50 years, you know? And they finally decided, we're not going to do this anymore. No, no, they didn't finally decide. Okay, but. Who, who decided? My mom. But she wasn't going to put up with it anymore. Yeah, after 50 years. And, and, and in her defense, we talked to her dad on, he, he was here several times. Yeah. We talked to him. I personally talked to him on multiple occasions saying, Rudy, I see me in you 100%. Everything that he's doing to his wife, I have never Jen. All the, the manipulation, all the, it, it wasn't, I mean. I feel like the ghost of Christmas Easter, you know, kind of going <laughs> to him and being like, if you don't change your no, life, no, seriously, the it, rug is going to get pulled out from you. I, How I, fitting is that? I still remember when it, when it, he was here like the ghost of Christmas Easter. I still remember when we pulled into Lakewood one day, he was with me. I'd, I'd driven around, so I had, I'm like, we haven't talked. And he tried to jump out of the car a couple of times. And he's a big, <laughs> big boy. And, uh, and I had to, I'm like, Rudy, stop. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just telling you right now, I knew 30 years ago. I've at least realized it. Why, what can you change now? Oh, I, right. So he went all excuses. But anyway, the point is that with her dad, of uh, the way that he, it wasn't until we got, until we were separated. We had a rental living in our house, so we couldn't move back in our house, and we were living down in Rosenberg with our parents. And we've been married 15 years at that time, 11, 12, 12 anyway, 10, 12 years. I would hear her dad say something to her mom. And I would break down and start crying. And I would walk up and I would grab her. I am so sorry. I said, I, I. now I had heard her dad say the exact same things for 12 years to her mom. Exact same thing. Didn't ever, it wasn't in my filter. It was just kind of a, I didn't even, literally didn't even hear it. It, it wasn't a, a, a an issue. It was just, okay, you know, no big deal. It didn't even make me think twice about it because I was doing the same thing to her. It just seemed natural. I think it's so amazing that God put you guys back there so that he could show you that. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole reason. It makes me cry. That, me too. That, that, that was so, that was so true because you were ready to change. But what I was going to ask so that other people will know is, when you were disrespecting her and talking to her the way you were, and I'm sure she was doing stuff to you too, why do why do men and women continue to do that? Why was it for you? Because of the insecurity, or you wanted to control her, or you just weren't respecting her? I mean, what was it that did that? So, a lot of it was insecurity. Of uh, even even so, I mean, from, the reason I married her was because she's the only girl I ever dated that stood up to me. Period. It would come down to the point to where we would, I would like, hey, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to go date other people. So I'll, I'll talk to you later. And then when I wanted to go back, no. Nobody got time for that. Yeah. No, she didn't. She said, she said nope. Nope. We're done. No. And here we are married. I'm like, you don't understand. That's, that's not how it works. See, what happens is I break up with you. I go do what I want to do. But then when I come back, you always come back. That's that's how it's always worked in my life. So, no, no, I didn't explain it that way to her, but in my mind, I'm like, no, no, I've always done that. They always come back. No. Whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean no? So she actually stood up to me when we had an argument. She would stand her ground, and but not in a godly way. Oh I, gosh, I, no, I was like, I was like, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> Like remember, fighting. Well, remember yeah. when you got out of my car on Highway 6? That was back in the world. I think I was, she was. Back then. I think like, no, I'm done. I'm out. Like, God's erased that memory. Yeah. <laughs> but, Thank you for her <laughs> But the fact is that, that 
that the looking back at it, uh, where did that control want to come from? And it was from insecurity. That was it. Because I felt I was in control and that I could do what I wanted to do without having, even though I loved her and married her for that reason, that reason is what kicked me off at the end. And so when it came down to us finally getting married and then looking back after 10, 11 years of marriage, of hearing her dad say this stuff, and it, it, it truly, guys, I, I, it's weird to say it, but it was kind of like there was a filter, there was on my eyes, on my ears, that none of that ever entered. I, I had no clue that her dad was saying those things to her because it, when I say it seemed normal, it wasn't that, that it even registered on my radar. It didn't even... Danny just had such a stronghold over you. I yes. never once even thought like, oh, what did he just say? Oh, you know, I, that's okay. That It was just kind of just a non-filter. Until we're back down there, it, it was probably seven or eight different times where I just felt like I kicked in the gut and started crying, and I'd walk up to him. Like, I am so sorry, because I now hear the way your dad's talking to your mom, and I hear that I, I've said the exact same thing to you that your dad just said to your mom. And that's before we even came to church. Oh, no, this, so this, this, this was right yeah. after the whole split happened. And the only reason we were living down in Rosenberg together is because I had no place to live at that time. We are, She already wanted a divorce. And so I'm trying you to... You kept me and giving me a hug and saying you're sorry. And I'm like, mm-hmm, should have thought about that like two years ago. <laughs> but, but, but she didn't understand where that was coming from. <laughs> yeah, but now I know. Like, in hindsight, even though we weren't putting God at the center of it, God was softening his heart. Mm-hmm. You know, God's promises is that he said he'll give us a new heart. <clears throat> That he'll take from us that heart of stone that we both had, and he'll give us the heart of flesh that's sensitive and responsive to his touch. And that's what he was doing. Now, when he said I was sticking up, I wasn't like, you know, oh, you know, I'm kind of insecure. I didn't talk about I never said you were godly. No, but I I said you were sticking up. But mine came (laughs) came from being independent and not saying, you know, and sticking up for myself. That was because I felt like completely abandoned when I was younger by my dad. And then I realized there's no man. That is ever going to treat me or talk to me or do anything like that. You know, he would go through, I'd have like a new purse or something like that. And his friends were like, oh, he takes really good care of you. And I'm like, oh, no, he doesn't. I bought this for myself. I don't need him taking care of me. I can take care of myself. And then if I need my parents' help, I'll have him help me out. But I'm not, I don't need anything from him. Because he's like, oh, we're going to get married and you can stay at home with the kids. I'm like, I am not staying home with the kids. If anything, you stay home with the kids and I'll go to work. You know, I mean, that's how, like, I mean, that's what he fell in love with. I was a wreck. Was it absolutely okay. right? By, by the way, yeah. that's not what I, I felt. Pretty, <laughs> I, 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 I tolerated that. that. Up on the inside. But but even back then, when, when she used to say that, it never it never really affected me. I, it wasn't something where to me it's like, yeah, that's her. She's independent. I had no idea where it was coming from, yeah. in that it was came from her seeing her mom always be beaten up. Not physically, but beating up, beating up. And all of this stuff that happened, that she said, I will never be in that position ever that my mom has been in. And guess what? Yeah. She was in that exact position and didn't realize it. Right. And then I would look at him and I remember, like, I started, thankfully, God took me back to when I was younger. And I got to really see, instead of being hurt, I was angry at my dad. I was really angry. And when he would act like that towards me, I became very angry and resentful with him. Why well, couldn't respect him? I didn't know that his his need was honor and respect. I didn't know that when I need to talk to him, I don't need to say, you just did this, and you just did that, and you just did this. you know. And immediately, the second you come to somebody and you say, you, what happens? The walls go up. They get in fight mode, especially if it's a man. The heart starts racing. And then he's not listening to anything. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you, you. You know? And so, but with that, now I know that whenever I have an issue or whenever he has an issue, where we can come back and say, you know, Mike, 
what you said, I received it this way. And he does it the same way. And then I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's not what I meant. And I'm able to listen to what he has to say. And I'm able to, you know, be able to extend grace and mercy to him when he's not always walking right. Just as he's able to give me that same mercy and grace, not always as quick as it needs to be, because that's going to be a handful. But, you know, God's working on him. You know, God's working on him. I love what you just said about you say something and he hears it a certain way. Uh-huh. And he he says something. You, I got out, um, I walked into the bathroom the other day and I asked Jeff, we're, help, we're, we're having someone help us lately in our home. And I said, "How? what do you dry your jeans on? And he said, oh, I don't. He says, I just get out, and he says something like, I just get out, and, and I just dry them on the rug. And I'm like, how do you dry your jeans on the rug? I'm I thinking, swear I'm wet. And he's all, <laughs> and I'm, yeah, and I'm like, he goes, I, this rug right here, he says, how did you dry his feet? Oh, that's funny. And I'm I was like, like oh and I stopped, God. and I'm like, that's why we fight, because of what you just heard. I didn't say, how do you dry your feet? <laughs> how do you dry your jeans? How do you dry your jeans on? Oh, this rug right here. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it's, it's not only the words, it, it's also more, the, the same thing as she was saying. Because uh, there are times where she'll, I'll hear her answer something to the kids. And I said, did you hear what they just said? Well, yeah. I'm like, okay, what did they just say? And she'll repeat. I'm like, no, that's not what they said. Me and you would do this all the time. Oh, my God. Around and around me. It was, and she's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't hear that part of it. I'm like, yeah, that, like the feet part, right? I heard they were doing this feet versus the feet jeans. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but, but when, when you look back at, at the history of where you've come from, of where you are now, the idea, the word, the, I, I don't know how to describe it, but respect had never entered my vernacular, ever. I had no clue about respect. That, that That's what I needed. Until Jimmy Ed, yeah. love and respect. And I didn't know that like my major need is love and security. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't giving me love and security. And I wasn't giving him honor and respect. And so, so in my personal opinion, love and respect, you've got to read that book. Yeah. It is the foundation. It builds that foundation of the basis of men, women, love, respect. On top of that is the five love languages. We should do that again. We haven't done that before. Oh. I should do that. Yeah. Love and respect. Because you build off of that love and respect because that's, that's to me, the, the basis. And there were times when my son – Connor, when he was two or three, would say something. Bam! What did you what did you just say? What in the world? Why am I snapping like that? Now I didn't think that at the time. In hindsight, I look back at it. I felt disrespected. There's one. With um my mom and my dad. And they fought all the time. We're sitting on I we're sitting on the floor cutting up, grabbing Christmas presents, and one of the few times my dad was actually there with us grabbing presents. And he was cutting the uh wrapping paper. And as he was doing it, he was kind of chewing it, like following it up and down with his mouth. Right? And so my mom and I kind of giggled a little bit. And he's like, what's well, funny? Like, yeah, every time you cut, you, you chew with your mouth. Are you effing kidding me? You think it's effing funny? Really? It's effing funny that I do that? Fine. F you guys. Do it your effing self. And stormed off. And that just resonates inside of me. And, and it wasn't until love and respect 
that I realized he felt disrespected by us. That's all. That was the furthest thing from our minds. It wasn't, hey, you're a bad dad, you're a bad person, you're this because of this. It was strictly a, hey, that's kind of kind of humorous. It's kind of cute. I mean, literally. But he felt ganged up on by myself and my mom. And, and I guess I was in eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade. Never wrapped present with him again. Never, I mean, up until then he hadn't really done it. But it was, now that I look back at it going, wow. At least now I can understand why did that because there have been I've never dropped the F bomb like that with, with kids, but it was where Connor would do something or Kaylee would do something and why in the heck am I snapping? I mean why why did that just me off? Like no get I mean it was just Yeah. Until love and respect. That's um, for whatever reason. And it's not that you did something wrong. It's not that you said something wrong, it's whatever you said just made me feel disrespected. I had to look inside of myself and go, okay, at least now I understand the trigger. And that's the key of understanding that trigger and going, okay, why did that make me feel disrespected? Was it because I was insecure about what they said? Was it because I was whatever it happens to be? Or is it just because that's just something that, that, that kicked in? But once you can understand those triggers, it makes a world of difference of how you handle and how you react. Now, I can tell you, I know she'll agree, that I am far from being where I need to be for my reaction. Because there are still times Connor or Kaylee or Jennifer will say something and it just, in a second, now, most of the time, I can catch myself and stop from spiral and going up to 110. And, okay, what just happened? Why did you feel disrespected by what they said? Okay, guys, listen. Here's what happened. Jen, what you just said to me made me feel extremely disrespected. And, and, the, and the worst part of it is, the, the worst part of it is, is that I know 100% that she never meant it the way that I took it. 100%. I know that. The sad part is, I still fight with myself. Happened last night. We're not perfect. Especially when it's like we teaching time. Far it's like we were doing good. We're like Monday, check mark. Tuesday, check mark. Wednesday, check mark. Thursday, check mark. Friday, <laughs> Saturday, yeah. you know, and, but and, and it, I humbled myself and apologized for but but it took me a lot longer to get over it uh, because whenever everything happened last night all I saw was I can't believe that you would do that that was extremely disrespectful I, I, I mean it was to the point to where I, I, I saw nothing but red and I was Furious. I felt so humiliated, so disrespected, so upset that there, there was, I, I was so far gone at that point when, when it all happened that I was like, I'm done. Done. I, I don't want to be around. You know, it's funny how we <clears throat> lots of times here that whoever's getting ready to teach this class, how they go through that right before. Yeah. Comes in <laughs> and to try to derail you because you have 
something very important to share with yep. us. And it's happy. He seems like he hears that a lot. And that's yeah. what, you know, he knows that and he wants to do so. Absolutely. Jeff, one second. One second. I want to piggyback on what he said. And I think leaders and ministers and pastors, but just Chiefs and families in general, yeah. when we get ready to go to church, is, yep. is there yep. something that's general mm-hmm. that we think about? We always stop to wish somebody a hundred or a you know mm-hmm. twice. So I'm sure exactly. It, it, and one second, Michelle. How many how many times have you sat there and thought with yourself of I'm not going to church, I'm not going to class, whatever? You force yourself to do it, and when you get there, you realize. Holy crap. That this was exactly why I wasn't supposed to be here. Especially right before conference. Yeah. yeah, because this is what I was supposed to hear. This little paragraph in your guys' chapter says, Make conflict your ally, not your enemy. It is the iron that sharpens iron in a marriage because we've heard so much conflict, including ourselves, from stories this week about someone fighting over cows being moved and you know, just silly sub church and this and that, but it, it's just such a race right now of what's happening from zero to ten. Yeah. And remember, someone taught me this week that here at church, a leader said, "You just have to say I'm sorry that I treated you that way. You're not saying I'm sorry that we were fighting because you haven't finished it or ended it, but you have to say that so the enemy has no foothold over here in your marriage. So you do not go to sleep mad. And I was have I had a hard time with that when I got mad. I did not want to go apologize. No way. I know, and it shocked me. My <laughs> I know. That's not and, and I would just text them and just say, I'm sorry, we'll talk about this later, but I'm sorry I was mean to you. Or, I'm and, sorry. And, and one second. So even today, this morning, I'm like, I apologize. I know you did. Don't care. Don't care. And at the end of it, she goes, are we okay? I'm like, about her. I said, yes, Jenny, we're okay. Meaning, I'm not sitting here thinking about divorcing. I'm really upset, but you don't have to worry about that part of it, which until we got into this class, I never realized she would ever think that. Because I'm security and love, right? Like, I need to ask that question. He knows I need to ask that question. I know his answer is, we are fine. We're in this until one of us dies in this. But I still needed to hear that because I felt like, I've done everything I can. I've apologized. I can't go back and rewind the clock, but God, you know, you're walking this through this. We're going to pass the test here. Yes, ma'am. So I was going to ask with Jennifer, do you go into that internally and go into that? Like, why did you just blow up? What was, What do you say? So so the good, the interesting thing is, is that I know he's like, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. But I prayed for him, and he's getting there. But, like, last night, you know, he, he, he was able to say, I can't talk about this anymore. I am so hurt. I'm done talking about this. I've got to go. And he hung up. And I knew that it was like, okay, he just needs to like take a moment because the old me, I wanted to make it right. So I right. like, you know, I'd be like, you know, it's like, hey, let's talk about this. You know, we're not, you know, and it's like, and, and, and in the past, I would have never hung up. You would have just gone on and I on. I would have on. unleashed <laughs> on her. Yeah. And I caught myself going, you know what, Mike, stop. Hey, and at my stop point, I had already gone way over the line with it. At my stop point, I had gone way over the line with stuff I said. Period. It was not okay for me to say the stuff I said. But the fact is that at least I caught myself there before I went even further. And I think too, like when he was when he had his rant, I don't remember what he said. So I'd like just turn my ears off. <laughs> You know, I, I can't tell you what he said because I heard uh, rare, 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 rare. I it's not like the Peanuts cartoon. <laughs> and I just, I didn't, I didn't hear. I knew in, initially what had happened, but then like two minutes into it, I, I, it wasn't mean. I wasn't like, oh my gosh, listen to this. I just, I was listening, but I wasn't listening. I wasn't letting it get on the inside of me because I was like, I'm going to apologize and say that I'm sorry. And I sent him a text that I'm sorry. And I figured, you know what? I don't want to say anything because I know it's going to go crazy because he's like, I'm done with this conversation. So I waited until this morning where I felt like, okay, Jen, the Holy Spirit said, go and tell him you're sorry. Now is the time. And and just try to work through it. And we were able to work through it. The thing is, is that like. Right. This morning, we're ready. 
I worked through it. I was like, <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. And I was like, Lord, soften his heart. He knows who I am. Just like I know who he is. But we can't do it. Oklahoma. We can't do text. Yeah. Oklahoma's our safe word. Means we got to stop this now. But uh, we did Oklahoma last night. So we've come a long way. Yeah. But, but we did do Oklahoma last night. No. We did do Oklahoma. We, we haven't done Oklahoma in a while. We're probably going to do Oklahoma when we get home. Oklahoma! <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But no. So, so my, my point is, is that she had worked herself through it. And she came, she truly came this morning and like, did you get my text? I'm sorry about what happened. And uh, you've got, I, I've got nothing to say to you. I have nothing to say to you right now. But, but no, but I, I know what you said. I have nothing to say to you. I don't want to be around you right now. I've got stuff i got to do. I don't want to be around you right now. And I could just keep saying, but I apologize. I'm sorry for it. I know. Normally, yeah. I don't do that. Normally, I'm like, I'm sorry. Goodbye. Tell me what, because that's what a lot of couples are going through. So tell me what's happening right there when you say, I can't, I'm not dealing with this. Because it's rejection of her. So what's going on with you because you just don't have the time? No, no, no. You just don't have the words or the feelings right now? Or do you think it's going to be a big fight? No. I, I would be fine with a big fight at that point. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that I am still so furious. About what happened, that I can't. My heart has not softened. My attitude has not softened. Nothing has softened. I am still furious about what happened. And you don't want to say, "I'm sorry," and then that's it. No, I, 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 I couldn't. She, she had said she was sorry multiple times, even in her text. I could not. I, I understood it. I couldn't receive it, and I didn't believe it. Now, when I say I didn't believe it, that's kind of the weird dichotomy, because I know 100% that what happened was not malicious. When I, I know that. Even this morning, when I'm going, I'm done with you, I knew it wasn't malicious. My pride, my ego, that's what happened? Because my pride was hurt last night. My ego was hurt last night. I was devastated. I bet their flesh is like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's not, that's not what I, when Reese and I did. He keeps saying, that's where it's so good. Like, Jeff and I and other couples. Because what you're doing there is you're still not trying to sell them a text. Yeah. It's going to get bigger. That's what I'm saying. Whatever's happening there, we receive it still as rejection because of our security. You guys, instead of you guys saying, we're good, but I'm not done with this hurt and pain, we'll revisit it. Me and you are safe, but this issue's not done. Well, that, that, that's that's what, what we need to tell each other. At, at the end of, at, before I left to go to my showing today, because I had 12 showings, it was a long day, but before I left, she said, are we good? Yes, Jim, we're good. And that at least gave her, I guess, the comfort that, okay, yeah, he's still really mad at me, but I know that he's not contemplating divorce, which, which I'm telling you right now, just boggled my mind. Because we weren't there. I'm healing, right? I'm being no, restored. But even before then, you had said that, that if I had just said those words. Yeah. It, I had no clue that those words meant, because in my mind, I said I do. I'm not, I, Divorce in all the fights we've had ever, divorce never once popped in my mind as there. That's an option. Never had a clue that, and we hear from women all the time of, all you have to say to me is, "We're good. We're good. I'm really upset, but we're still okay." Why is it so hard for men to say we're good? Why is it so hard for men to reassure us? It's a very simple oh, question. So good. Because great we question. have pride and we have ego. Ego extinguishing great opportunity. And, it's, and I think the whole thing is, is like sometimes, I think Michael said this before, it's, and it's a lie of the enemy because the enemy wants you to believe that you saying we're fine, him saying he's fine, him saying he's sorry, 
It's him being weak. No, 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 hang on. Hang on. There's a huge difference between we're fine and I'm sorry. At least for, from my standpoint, from a guy's standpoint. I can tell you right now. We're both fine. No. I have no I have no problem saying we're fine. No problem whatsoever. By me saying we're fine does not mean that I'm saying I'm sorry. Not even close. And I am horrible, horrible about saying I'm sorry. Even when I know I should. And it's in my head. Dude, just say you're sorry. <laughs> you screwed up. Say you're sorry. Nope, I fight myself over and over and over. Because saying I'm sorry means I'm weak. Meaning I'm sorry destroys my ego. Meaning I'm sorry, saying I'm sorry destroys my pride. Means that you were wrong sometimes too. Yeah. Oh no, every time I'm wrong. <laughs> you guys don't tell us that? No, no we don't. It, because our ego, and it, I'm t there are so many times, every time, where she'll say I'm sorry, and God say, dude, just say you're sorry. I have no problem saying I'm, we're fine. Even this morning, like, yeah, yeah, we're fine. You, you know he's the reason for your arguments with God, because the minute he says he's sorry, we can stop going around the mountain. Well, it's kidding. <laughs> well, the thing is, that is our lesson. No, I was like, when too. I went to him today, I was hurt, because the way that what he had said made it seem like I did it malicious. Like, I was a malicious person. And I even told him today, I said, you know what? Five or six years ago, maybe, not a good godly woman, and I repeat that. I'm not a malicious person. And I said, I'm sorry. But then that... God softened my heart so I could pray for him so that his heart would be softened so he can work through this. Because the second he says he's sorry, I'm safe and secure again. The enemy doesn't want him saying he's sorry. Especially when you're going to come to this. Right. Yeah. The second I say I'm sorry, I'm giving him respect. I'm giving him love. Well, it was, it, it was so hard initially to be able to say I'm sorry to him. And God said, do you want relief? Do you want this resolved? Do you want me to work on him? Well, then you tell him you're sorry because you've disrespected him. You've disrespected my son. Mm -hmm. And I do that. And I and it's free, it doesn't free me completely, but I can be at peace mm -hmm. in the midst of the crazy as he's working through it. And ladies, I, I can tell you right now, there is no way in the world that it's fair. There is no way in the world that it should be this way. But without you guys being able to humiliate, to, be, to um, humble yourselves, to tell us that, even when you you know that it wasn't your fault, you know that we screwed up. I want to apologize for all men. <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. For all men. Because I say it all the time, without her being able to do that, there's no way in the world we would be where we are right now. Because I'm still horrible about it. And, and it's without her sitting there and saying, Michael, I didn't mean it that way. And my, I'm like, how did it how, how did that? How did you not mean it that way? Or Mike, I didn't receive it that way. How in the world could you receive it any different? It was a great thing I was saying, but I didn't receive it that way. But, but how? Michael, I, I love you. Sorry, I didn't receive it that way. It received, I received it hurtful, and I'm done. And she walks away, and I'm sitting there going, there's no way anybody in the world could receive that wrong. It was a, it was a great thing. I was on your side. I was helping you. And God's going, really, Mike? Really? No, God. Really, how could anybody think that that was a negative? It was a positive. I was wondering, Mike, it doesn't matter what you thought. How did she receive it? God, you don't understand. This is what I said. How could anybody? And this goes on in my head for 10, 15 minutes after she walked away. So would it be terrible if I'm like, I know what's going on in your head. I would highly recommend <laughs> never, ever, and ever doing that. Let God work on you. But, uh, yeah, but, but the fact is that that it, it, it comes down to, women, you guys are 
much, usually, much more in touch with the Holy Spirit. And that you can sit there and let pride go. Even when you know you're right. And say, sorry to hurt you. Sorry I felt disrespectful. I didn't mean it that way. And then let us and let God work on us. There are some guys out there that are the exact opposite. And they do that and their wives can't say, I'm sorry. But the fact is that we need that. And it didn't, it wasn't until I guess around three o'clock today, whenever I finally was able to call Jen and say, What? I agree with tags. Hey, sorry what happened. And but God has softened my heart. But it took that amount of time. So thank you, ladies, for being the amazing people that you are. Okay, we are wrapping this up. Go pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this wonderful day. I thank you for the wonderful time that you've given us here today. Dear Lord, I just declare a hedge of protection around every person in this room, around every marriage in this room, dear Lord. I don't care if they're here by themselves or with their spouse, or if they're here with their spouse and they're separated, dear Lord, that you will bring them together. I declare that everybody here will see what's in their spouse, that will see that their spouse is not the person that completes them, it's the person that is the opposite of them, that actually accelerates them, that takes all of their negatives and makes them positive. And then they take their spouse's negatives and makes them positive. Dear Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for these people. I thank you for all that you've done for these marriages, for all, for all the children that you are saving, dear Lord, from seeing their spouses, seeing their parents raise up against each other. That we know the enemy is not after our marriages. We know the enemy is after our children, after our grandchildren, and that it, they, the enemy is looking for a legacy to continue to destroy him. And dear Lord, I declare right now that those chains are broken, that there is nothing that is going to hinder any child, any person, anybody in this room. I declare, dear Lord, that everybody in here is going to go home. They're going to be protected. They are going to continue to work on the marriage. Understand that every peak cannot come about unless there's a valley. And the deeper the valley, dear Lord, the higher that peak is going to be. And I declare high, high, high peaks for everybody in here, dear Lord. And we sharpen our swords when we're not in battle. That's why we're here, to sharpen our swords before we get in that battle. So we have the sharpest swords to make sure we can defeat that enemy whenever he comes at us and doesn't want us to be here. I thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, uh.